It's my pleasure to welcome all of you and to, uh, in particular, to uh, introduce my boss. Uh, um, so I have to say this nicely. Um, uh, <clears throat> I don't think uh, Dean Frank needs much introduction to all of you. Uh, I've known him since about 1997 when uh, he encouraged me to uh, work on developing uh, benchmarks of fairness, which was an American oriented product for use in developing countries. And in a lot of ways, that began my uh, interest in global health and my activity in it. So I am greatly appreciative of uh, Julio Frank's inspiration in that regard. Um, since uh, January 2009, uh, Dean Frank um, uh, has been the dean here at the School of Public Health and the uh, TNG uh, Angelopoulos uh, Professor of Public Health and International Development. And this is a joint appointment with uh, Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, he served as Minister of Health in Mexico from 2000 to 2006. Uh, where he introduced universal health coverage. And that is clearly one of the reasons that we look forward to his remarks today, um, since few of us have had as important a role to play in promoting universal coverage as Dean Frank. Um, uh, he was the founding director of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico and has uh, held leadership positions uh, at the Mexican Health Foundation, uh, the World Health Organization, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Carso Health Institute. Um, <clears throat> he holds a medical degree and also a master's and a joint doctorate in medical care organization and sociology from the University of Michigan. The medical degree is from uh, uh, National University of Mexico, UNAM. Uh, he's a member of the U.S. Uh, Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy, Academy of Medicine in Mexico. Uh, he's written, um, uh, this would shame many of us, 33 books and uh, monographs and 63 book chapters, uh, 130 articles in academic and professional journals, and 117 articles in cultural periodicals and uh, newspapers. Uh, two of his books are best-selling novels, novels, I might add, um, <laughs> for youngsters uh, explaining the functions of the human body. So uh, with no further ado, please, Dean Frank. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Norm. Uh, I hope you all caught the irony in the introduction, because anyone who knows what universities are about, you will know that there are no bosses here. Uh, this is not a, a place where, uh, contrary to other places I work, where you have any sense of uh, authority other than uh, persuasion. If, if anything, we are the servants of the faculty. So, uh, but thank you anyway for. <laughs> for saying that. Um, I also find it amusing uh, that since I came here, a lot of people now think that my first name is Dean. So I, I, when I see Dean Jamieson, I say when, when he becomes Dean of a school, what are they going to call him? Dean Dean? Um, but anyway, I'd like to thank the, the organizers of, uh, of this uh, really splendid conference and this long series of conference. Uh, and I'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to acknowledge that really the pioneering work uh, of the Harvard University program in uh, ethics and health, and uh, especially the work now of the legendary three Dans, uh, Normal Daniels, that's Dan, Dan Wickler, and Dan Brock, uh, who in addition to the you know, more traditional topics in bioethics, really have uh, wisely addressed the ethical dilemmas implicit in resource allocation and really explored, like I, don't, I, I think no other group, the ethical dimension of health systems. Now, it is interesting to note that the word dan in Hebrew means judge. 
And uh, so there is no doubt that um, uh, honoring their names, uh, they are going to help us judge the uh, ethical soundness of public policies in, in health matters. So what I'd like to do this morning is to discuss with you uh, actually the use of a, a very explicit ethical framework uh, to guide a case of actual health system reform whose purpose was to uh, implement um, universal and effective, the universal and effective realization of the right to health care. And in fact, I hope um, uh, this case will address very directly some of the questions that Ole just, uh, I, I thought, very nicely uh, posed. Now, I know all of you are saying, when does the slideshow begin? And I have to tell you that I'm going to give you a PowerPoint break. There are no slides here. Uh, now, that means you actually need to pay attention to what I'm going to say, <laughs> or you can just go to sleep. But uh, if at any point you uh, lose the, your concentration, um, um, actually some of the notions I'm going to, to share with you this morning uh, I captured in, in, in a paper that has the provocative title of Ideas and Ideals, and that was published uh, recently in The Lancet with my colleague Octavio Gomez Dante. So uh, some of these things are actually written. But let me start just by saying that, as many of you probably know, uh, just a few months ago in 2012, Mexico announced to the world a major milestone, uh, uh, the, the achievement of universal health coverage. Uh, with 52 million people who were previously uninsured now fully covered by a new and comprehensive insurance scheme, this developing country, Mexico, has reached a globally cherished goal that nonetheless has eluded most poor nations and one very notorious rich nation. I leave it to you to guess which one that is. Um, my, my main message today is that a clear and explicit ethical framework combined with technical excellence and political skill can actually uh, deliver results. And, and indeed, the Mexican reform was designed, implemented, and evaluating using, ma making explicit use of what Michael Reich and some of his colleagues here at the Harvard School of Public Health have called the three pillars of public policy, the technical pillar, the political pillar, and the ethical pillar. The three are really closely interrelated because they must work together, uh, you know, in this ar architectural metaphor, to sustain the edifice of um, health reform. So um, I'm not going to spend much time in the first two pillars. Uh, lots has been written about especially the technical aspects, but foc I will focus more on the ethical component. Let me just remind you on the technical side that uh, this is, uh, uh, I call it a textbook case of evidence-based policy. That, that was the technical underpinning was really the intensive use of, of evidence. Um, a very careful analysis had revealed a, a, cr a crucial deficiency, contrary to most people's ex uh, preconception that we had a publicly funded system. When we actually calculated national health accounts, it turned out, like it happens in many countries of the world, that actually most uh, pay mo the, or the main source of financing was out-of-pocket payments, um, and, uh, and that this was bringing uh, a large number of households close to four million uh, uh, into bankruptcy or, or impoverishment. So in Mexico, um, like in so many developing countries, the evidence showed clearly that the country simply, had, the health system simply had not kept up with the pressures derived from a complex, protracted, and polarized epidemiologic transition, whereby malnutrition, common infections, and maternal mortality coexist with non-communicable diseases and injury. Uh, and it hadn't kept up, among other things, because, like in, again, so many countries, access to insurance had been construed as a benefit of employment rather than a right of citizenship. And that meant that everyone who did not have a salary job was excluded from insurance. In the case of Mexico, around in the year 2000, with around 100 million people, that meant that half of the population, 50 million people, were uninsured. And that was facing the country with an unacceptable paradox, because by then, there was uh, substantial evidence that improving health is one of the most powerful means to empower people to lift themselves out of poverty. And yet paying for care had become itself a major source of impoverishment, and that was an unacceptable paradox. And the reform was introduced exactly to correct uh, this paradox by creating a new public insurance scheme called Seguro Popular, or People's Health Insurance, which, as I mentioned before, is now covering f actually 52 million people um, so basically, um, 
everyone who was uninsured previously. Most of these are poor people who had been excluded from traditional social insurance tied to uh, salary employment. Now, in addition to the technical component of designing and implement, guiding the implementation and evaluating the reform, the technical pillar also uh, helps strengthen the political pillar because this evidence, which challenged everybody's preconceptions, actually uh, forced politicians to um, realize that the status quo was uh, completely uh, unacceptable. And the uh, convincing or persuasive evidence actually helped build a strong consensus in a country that was at that point in the early stages of, uh, of a full democracy, of, uh, of a fully democratic country. So uh, the negotiation process was, was greatly aided by actually the presence of good, good evidence, plus the uh, application of a pilot process that yielded uh, some interesting data on feasibility. Uh, this large consensus building effort culminated in, in uh, the year 2003 when a, a large majority of all political parties represented in the Congress actually approved a major legislative reform that established a system of a, a universal system of social protection in health. That was the concept that was used, which would be operationalized through Seguro Popular, through this ins new insurance scheme. Um, obviously, the construction of the political pillar does not end with the enactment of new laws, but must continue into the implementation phase. The political side is also important in the implementation. And in our case, in particular, uh, the fact that the law mandated a built-in evaluation process, a lot of which, by the way, was carried out with a lot of help from researchers here at, at Harvard. This um, uh, evaluation, again, part of a technical pillar, helped the reform actually to survive the change, not of one, but of two administrations, um, and, uh, and to be actually embraced by, by following uh, uh, administrations. Again, showing how the technical and the political pillars uh, uh, reinforced each other. Now, achieving consensus in the midst of a young democracy that was still groping its way into a new set of political rules was very much aided by the third pillar, by explicit ethical deliberation on the moral implications of the existing arrangements, which, as I stated before, excluded half of the population from effective social protection and excluded people on the basis of their position in the labor market. So let me turn to the, really the core of my presentation or my conversation with you today, which is the ethical pillar. The starting premise was straightforward. And I think only you more or less said it. Every health system, every health system reflects a series of ethical assumptions. Consciously or unconsciously, explicitly or implicitly, these assumptions are expressed in the distribution of healthcare benefits and in the way we organize institutions. Uh, alongside then the formulation of political proposals and uh, political strategies and technical proposals, every attempt to reform the health system must begin by asking which values should it promote. And in this way, uh, the ethical foundations of reform proposals can be made uh, clear and transparent. So in this spirit, the Mexican reform was formulated and proposed uh, and, and promoted in the public debate on the basis of a guiding concept and a set of explicit values that are related to the fundamental notion that healthcare should not be seen as a commodity or a privilege, but as a social right. The privilege side was exactly because in 1943, when social insurance was introduced, the idea was to start with the salaried workers as part of the move towards industrialization, the civil servants, and the military. And, uh, and that was the notion of uh, social privilege. The commodity, of course, uh, view was expressed in the private marketplace of health services. And the idea was ex exactly to say that those two conceptions were not um, the ones we were embracing, but rather to think of uh, access to healthcare as a social right. So the guiding concept underlying the Mexican reform was what we call the democratization of health, which the basic idea is to expand the notion of democracy, democracy to the realm of social rights. Uh, according to uh, O'Donnell and Schmitter, uh, two very famous writers in this uh, domain, the term democratization 
implies the application of the norms and procedures of citizenship to those institutions that have been governed by other principles, such as coercive control, social tradition, judgment of specialist or bureaucratic processes. Democratization also implies applying those norms and procedures to individuals who did not enjoy the benefits or duties of citizenship, such as women in many parts of the world, young people, ethnic minorities, or other disadvantaged groups. In his seminal work, Class, Citizenship, and Social Development, uh, Marshall recognizes three types of rights involving the idea of citizenship, civil rights, political rights, and social rights. And according to him, citizenship culminates in the effective exercise of social rights. Now, as a result of its own democratization process, Mexico had made considerable progress in the exercise of political and civil rights, the first two categories. So it was clear that the next great challenge was to ameliorate inequalities by assuring also the extension of the notion of democracy to the exercise of social rights, including first and foremost the right to health care. Now, this right had been, in the case of Mexico, recognized in the Mexican Constitution since three decades before, since 1983. So while it was enshrined in the Constitution, in practice, it, not every person had been able to exercise it. It's easier to endorse than to enforce rights. And uh, that was exactly what was happening. Because the way it was exercised was mediated by the occupational position of people. So as I said before, half of the population had salaried jobs and therefore enjoyed the protection afforded by social insurance. Half of the population were either self-employed, unemployed, or altogether out of the labor market and therefore lacked such protection. And more importantly, what was lacking was an explicit definition, a definition of the explicit entitlements that ensued from the legal recognition of the right to health care. So the notion of entitlements becomes the way of operationalizing the idea of a right. And that was not defined. Also lacking were the organizational and financial vehicles to translate those entitlements into effective health services for all. The definition of the disentitlements in the recent Mexican reform was actually very explicitly, again, uh, based on the adoption of five key values that were thoroughly discussed in public fora uh, in the years prior to the reform and that actually underlie and, and give concrete meaning to the notion of democratization. And these values are social inclusion, equality of opportunity, financial justice, individual autonomy, and social responsibility. Uh, social inclusion is based on the premise that all human lives have the same value and that health systems must represent instances where everybody, regardless of socioeconomic or labor market status, receives similar treatment for similar needs. Since the great majority of health deficits are involuntary, it follows that no type of discrimination in access to health services can be morally valid. The second value, equal opportunity, is based on Amartya Sen's notion that inequality can, keep, can be viewed in terms of differences either in actual achievement or in the freedom to achieve, which is the real opportunity that we have to accomplish what we value. Health services should help each generation to enter life with the same opportunities and in this sense, ensuring a basic common floor of health care for everyone has the same sense of justice as primary education. Equality of opportunity, in fact, offers an, the ethical justification for a fair, fair distribution of, of wealth. The third value, financial justice, means that individuals contribute to the health system according to their financial capacity and receive services according to their health needs. Okay, you contribute according to financial capacity, you receive according to needs. Now, out-of-pocket payments are unfair because they lead exactly to the opposite relationship. People contribute according to need. The sickest pay the most and receive services according <coughs> to financial capacity. So it's exactly the opposite as the principle of financial justice. In contrast, a fair health system is financed in such a way that services are free at the point of delivery and a large enough risk pool is aggregated to facilitate three types of solidarity. Risk solidarity between the healthy and the sick, 
generational solidarity between the young and the old, and distributive solidarity between the wealthy and the poor. The fourth value, individual autonomy, means that every person enjoys the freedom to decide what is more convenient for him or her. And autonomy is expressed in free choice, which in the case of health services has a special meaning that sets them apart from other goods. Uh, because the intimacy uh, entailed by many healthcare situations makes it necessary to empower uh, uh, patients to select those prof pro professionals in whom they can place their trust. And such empowerment has the added advantage that uh, through a well-designed reimbursement system, it can actually generate incentives for providers to be responsive to the legitimate expectations of their patients for a healthcare process that respects their dignity. And then finally, uh, there's the value of social responsibility, the fifth value, which places limits on the freedom proposed by the previous value of individual autonomy. And this is particularly important in the case of goods such as health services that exhibit important externalities. That is to say, consequences to others of an individual's actions. Thus, neglect to care for one's own health has effects on other persons. And this generates a responsibility that limits the freedom to be neglectful. In addition, the involuntary nature of most health deficits imposes a shared responsibility to care for the persons who experience uh, them, who experience those health deficits. So these uh, five values created the ethical foundation for the establishment of a, of a system that provides, through Seguro Popular, financial protection in health to all those persons that had been excluded from the benefits of social insurance. The new scheme is mostly financed with federal resources, along with state allocations, and a small family contribution that depends on the level of income and is waived for those in the two lowest income deciles. And the idea was to make it universal in the sense of including everyone, not uh, targeted to the poor, but with a uh, formula like the one I just explained. Now, the most interesting aspect of the new financial formula, formula is that its point of departure was the definition and costing of the specific entitlements that would give operational meaning to the right to health care enshrined in the Constitution. Those, what you were calling the key, the key uh, benefits, well, we call them the entitlements. Thus, the law now stipulates a budgetary obligation for the government in order to meet the expected demand from each family that enrolls in the Seguro Popular. So rather than the standard way, which we proceed very often in universal health coverage, which we start with the input side, and we say, well, you know, we need a million doctors, and we need so many nurses, so many community health workers, we need so many hospital beds and so many drugs, the input side, this approach started with the actual results. So we stipulated in an explicit manner what were the benefits, the, the, the goals, the health goals that were to be achieved, and the financial protection goals that were explicitly set out. That then got translated into the set of interventions that through evidence had demonstrated would achieve those goals. Those interventions were costed using a certain standard of quality that was achievable because it was the highest standard observed in the country. Because we were removing a financial barrier, we were expecting a rise in demand, so the volume of demand was also estimated. And through that process, we concluded that the country needed one additional percentage point of GDP in public expenditure. Now, for the non-economists, maybe one percentage point sounds like very little, but as any economist will know, it's a lot of money. Because the logic was so tight, rather than asking for a blank check, like when we say 5% of GDP should be spent in healthcare, and you don't say for what, right? That's asking society for a blank check. Or rather than asking for, an, for more inputs, which again doesn't specify the expected benefits to society, this logic was very, very persuasive with the most formidable obstacle to universal co co coverage, which are usually ministers of finance. But we actually managed to get the Minister of Finance to be a strong ally because the logic was very, it was writing a new social contract where there was a commitment to certain benefits to be delivered, explicitly stated, against a, an investment of an additional point of GDP over a seven year uh, period. Um, so uh, th this is the key concept 
of, of the reform, the absolutely key concept. Now, it, 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 perhaps even more importantly, the explicit definition of the set of entitlements became the basis of what we call democratic budgeting, as opposed to bureaucratic budgeting, where money follows people in, other, in order to assure the best balance of quality and efficiency. More specifically, the guaranteed entitlements uh, comprise two sets um, uh, of interventions uh, when it comes to personal health services and then an additional uh, fund, a separate fund for community health services. But for personal health services, there are two sets of entitlements. First, a package of over 260 essential interventions for health conditions of high incidence and relatively low cost, which account for more than 95% of the demand for services. And second, a package of 67 high cost interventions that cover diseases with low incidence but catastrophic costs. And that included treatment for HIV AIDS, critical neonatal conditions, cancer in children, cervical and breast cancer, am among, among others. Um, what I'd like to end up with is just discuss briefly with you the ethical implications of the use of a package of essential interventions which has been traditionally an instrument of technocratic approaches to healthcare in a reform process that emphasizes equity and social justice. This sounds like an oxymoron, but I'm going to try to show that it's not an oxymoron. The packages of essential health services have been derived uh, or devised mostly as a priority setting tool, right? Mostly by economists. Uh, Future Dean Dean is uh, largely guilty for this <laughs> tradition. And uh, of course, Tessa Tantores, who I saw here, has taken it to an art form uh, along with David Evans and so forth. Uh, but it, this has been mostly a tool for priority setting. So, you know, in a, in a context of limited resources, cost effectiveness analysis has been used to identify those interventions that can provide the largest amount of benefits for the available public resources. And those interventions very often are targeted um, to the poor. The Mexican reform, these packages did respond to concerns for priority setting. However, their adoption was enriched through the incorporation of additional selection criteria in addition to cost of effectiveness. It was also enriched by their use as a uh, planning and a quality assurance tool and their extension to a universalistic conception of coverage based on the explicit definition of entitlements. Let, let me briefly touch on, on these innovations. First, we selected interventions making use of a broader set of criteria. We did use cost effectiveness analysis, but we also made use of social acceptability, and that was actually written into the law, that, pr that the set of entitlements would be defined by criteria of cost effectiveness and social acceptability. And that was in order to conform to the norms of behavior of the uh, health professions and to broader social preferences ascertained through consultative uh, processes. Um, second, the package of intervention, in addition to allowing to define the set of entitlements, it provides the blueprint to estimate resources in order to strengthen the health system and it provides a blueprint so that we could develop master plans for infrastructure, medical equipment, and health personnel. So rather than coming up with arbitrary numbers of how many doctors, it's the doctors and nurses and community health workers, the facilities and the technologies, to what? To actually have the capacity to provide that package of entitlements. And third, the package was also used as a fundamental quality assurance tool uh, because the law required for the first time that participating providers in the new insurance scheme had to be accredited. And again, what do you accredit them against? you accredit them against their capacity to deliver the interventions contained in the set of entitlements. And finally, and very importantly, the package was designed as an instrument for empowering people by making them aware of their entitlements. And um, what I call pseudo-universalistic uh, proposals that say everything for everyone, this empower people and leave the power in the hands of bureaucrats who can then operationally uh, re ration uh, what services are actually provided. So explicitness is actually a political tool to empower people and change the balance of power in the health system. The new uh, law in Mexico clearly states that Seguro Popular beneficiaries will have access to all the health interventions included in both packages and their respective drugs and other inputs. And in fact, at the moment of enrollment, 
all families receive an explicit charter, which is called a Charter of Duties and, Respons and, and Rights, uh, that explicitly lists the health interventions to which they are entitled. The law also stipulates that the package must be progressively expanded and updated annually on the basis of changes in the epidemiologic profile, technological developments, and the availability of resources. So that means that you know one of those dimensions in the cube uh, uh, can expand progressively the, the number of benefits uh, covered um, uh, and be a dynamic tool. It's not set in stone once and for all. Um, the covered services uh, are analyzed and chosen on the basis of then these three criteria that I already uh, mentioned. In fact, with uh, the very valuable help of Norman Daniels, uh, we were able to work on the design of a fair process, a fair deliberative process, to, especially for the second package that contained the high cost uh, interventions. And we can talk more about uh, that um, uh, in the Q&A. Um, so in summary, this uh, model may be seen as an option to reconcile what have been seen as two extremes the selective technocratic approach to the distribution of healthcare, which provides practical alternative but is usually morally neutral or purports to be morally neutral, and the rights-based approach, which has a strong value foundation but has lacked operational support. It's an attempt to bring those two together. In this matter of values, we really find a, an opportunity to bridge the local and the global. Uh, values vary across nations and over time, yet health touches such fundamental aspects of human life that there may be grounds to develop a limited set of common values without reducing the rich diversity of human culture, uh, thus helping to build what Baclav Havel, the um, uh, late president of the Czech Republic, called a basic code of mutual existence, a, a, a kind of minimum we can all share, he said. He said actually in a commencement speech here at Harvard. The, point, the important point, uh, and with this I will conclude, is that social rights are, uh, also belong to the category of second generation human rights, which are by definition inherent in every person. Therefore, the struggle to extend them transcends local legislations and even the idea of national citizenship. This means that the demand for health care can come from anybody and not just from the legally defined citizens of a given country. Um, which is, of course, especially relevant given the high level of migration that characterizes our interconnected work, world. The implications of a rights-based approach are, are very clear to my mind, and they are that it is unethical to limit access to health services on the basis of the migratory or legal status of any person, something that's a particular, was a very explicit point in the debates on health reform in this country, and which to my mind, was resolved in a way that is not defensible from an ethical perspective, or uh, that at least contradicts the notion that this is a, a second generation set of human rights. Uh, the human uh, nature of the right to health care also implies that support for this claim can come from anywhere in the world, and this, of course, opens an enormous field of action for international advocacy and, indeed, for global solidarity, and is probably the, most, the strongest and driver of building a notion of global citizenship. So in that spirit, I'd like to end by quoting the words of Michael Ignatieff, uh, who a famous historian and writer and political leader who uh, until a few years ago directed the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy here at Harvard, and who now, uh, I'm ha glad to say, is now back with us um, after a brief experience in the Canadian politics. Um, and, and he, in the year 2000 in Toronto, he delivered the famous uh, Macy lectures, and, and he stated some, uh, something that I'd like to leave you with. Let me quote from, from Michael Ignatieff. He said, rights are, sometimes, are, are, rights are something more, something more than dry legalistic phrases, because they represent our attempt to give legal meaning to the values we care most about dignity, equality, and respect. Rights have worked their way deep into our psyches. Rights are not just instruments of the law. They are expressions of our moral identity as a people. When we see justice done, we feel a deep emotion rise within us. That emotion is the longing to live in a fair world. Rights may be precise, legalistic, and dry but they are the chief means by which human beings express this longing. 
And it is important to understand that this longing is a global phenomenon. That's the quote. I would add that alongside the longing for justice, rights also generate a sense of belonging, since they point to our common identity as members of the human race. It's been my privilege to share these ideas with all of you. I uh, hope that this will be a very exciting two days, and I look forward to the rest of the discussions. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, my, my boss is telling me that we have a, a, a few minutes for uh, some questions or comments, if anyone cares to, to yes, please. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the generational solidarity in the, in the specific case of Seguro Popular in Mexico. Uh, when I see the fiscal projection of, of the United States, it is very clear that Medicare, Medicaid, and, and the Social Security are the most important components for the fiscal burden in the United States in the long term. Have you considered in the design of the Seguro, uh, Seguro Popular the process of aging of the Mexican population and the fiscal pressures in the future? Yeah, the answer is very much so. It was a big part of uh, the reasons why we were able to persuasively argue that the system was underfinanced. So, uh, you know, the system had been designed both institutionally but also financially in the, in the 1940s in a very different demographic and epidemiologic reality. And it was exactly the, um, you know, the evidence about the fact of how the epidemiologic picture was changing, driven to a large extent by the sharp decline in fertility that happened in the country in the, starting in the 70s, that drove this process of aging along, obviously, with the extension of, of longevity. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, Mexico, like many developing countries with hu huge out-migration, if you think about it, I mean, there are in this period of... Uh, what um, you know, some demographers, some of them here at Harvard, like David Bloom and David Canning, have called the uh, demographic uh, bonus or the demographic dividend, uh, the period of time when you have a bulge in the working age population. But what our migration does is it actually exports a demographic bonus. And that's what's happened uh, with the United States. And that's why it's, um, additionally to the arguments I made, extremely unfair to deny those people who actually provide the economics <coughs> impetus for dealing with the aging in this country, uh, depriving them from the right to, ex explicitly excluding them from the Affordable Care Act. But uh, so the aging is compounded in countries with large, you know, migrants, who, economic migrants, um, are a self-selected group. And they're usually young and highly productive. Otherwise, they can't find a job. Um, as opposed to academic migrants like me, they are, uh, these productive migrants are, tend to be young people. And so exactly you compound the aging in the sending country by this process, which just underscores the need for a, a more universalistic approach in the other sense of the word universal, which is to include every country in the world. We have time for one more question. Yes, please. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my concern is uh, the issue of uh, breaking the political firewall of getting the policy of universal coverage accepted by the highest level of office in the country. I recall that recently the Kenyan parliament passed the bill for universal coverage but Mr. President refused to give assent. In Nigeria in 2011, the parliament passed the health care bill. The president refused to give assent. And in each of those two occasions, the reason was because the financial implications of implementing those documents was too high for the government to bear. So may you let us know, please, what happened in the case of Mexico. How were the policy drafters able to 
convince Mr. President that this is something worth doing and something that they can do. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I would say even that before Mr. President, Mr. Minister of Finance was the first target because those are usually the, um, the first hurdle uh, because they, they have this short-term view of the budgetary implications. Now, Mexico, in that period of time I served as minister, had a very orthodox minister of finance. And everyone says, how on earth did you pass a law that created entitlements for which, you know, good ministers of finance will almost have an anaphylactic reaction when they hear the word entitlement. Two, created a budgetary obligation over uh, a seven-year period with, with increases that actually added to one additional percentage point of GDP. Uh, how did that happen? It happened with good evidence and because we showed, I think convincingly, that the status quo was more, more uh, expensive than this, that this was going to cost one point, but that the status quo was more expensive. I think the best decision I ever made was to create an economic analysis unit in the ministry and hire a card-carrying PhD in economics from Chicago, same place that the Minister of Finance had gotten his PhD, um, to actually come to the meetings with very, very, very solid evidence. And what we showed was a graph where, like in Kenya, the parliament had passed a, uh, had passed an, um, a law that required to get to 5% of GDP over a four-year period. Okay, it was two and a half, so it was doubling the GDP for public expenditures. That was a doubling and two and a half per percentage points in a four-year period, and it was the kind of approach that's the blank check approach, you know, 5%, why 5%, and what are you going to do with that money? That was not stipulated. Then we also showed the inertial growth of public expenditures in health, driven by aging, by the changing in, in, in the epidemiologic picture, by the rise in education, and by the rise in political mobilization of people which were demanding health services. And we showed that even without a reform, just with a simpler projection, that was going to get the country beyond the additional one percentage point. And then we showed our proposal, which was lower and over a longer period. And we said, you either have the choice of accepting you know, this larger increase that's already been passed by one of the two houses, and if it's voted by the second house, you're going to have to do something about it, like veto it, like you did, which is politically very expensive. Or you have the choice of following the inertia with the current set of great inefficiencies we have, which we had documented. So, you know, there's a notion also here developed in a recent book published by, um, by the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights called The Cost of Inaction. It's the error of thinking that not acting is costless. And the opportunity cost of failing to act is very often more, is, uh, larger than the, uh, than the cost of acting. And it was actually making those arguments with very s strong set of numbers. And it shows, again, the interplay of the technical and the political pillars in a, in a very clear way. But that, that was the, the way we, we faced exactly the same resistance, but showing that this was actually less expensive than not implementing it was the key uh, to be persuasive. To large extent by the sharp decline in fertility that happened in the country in the, starting in the 70s that drove this process of aging along, obviously, with the extension of, of longevity. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, Mexico, like many developing countries with hu huge out-migration, if you think about it, I mean, there are in this period of uh, what, um, you know, some demographers, some of them here at Harvard, like David Bloom and David Canning, have called the uh, demographic uh, bonus or the demographic dividend, uh, the period of time when you have a bulge in the working age population. But what out-migration does is it actually exports a demographic bonus. And that's what's happened uh, with the United States. And that's why it's, um, additionally to the arguments I made, extremely unfair to deny those people who actually provide the economics <coughs> impetus for dealing with the aging in this country, uh, depriving them from the right to, ex explicitly excluding them from the Affordable Care Act. But uh, so the aging is compounded in countries with large, you know, migrants, who, economic migrants, um, are a self-selected group, and they're usually young and highly productive, otherwise they can't find a job. Um, as opposed to academic migrants like me, they are, uh, these productive migrants are, tend to be young people. 
And so exactly you compound the aging in the sending country by this process, which just underscores the need for a, a more universalistic approach in the other sense of the word universal, which is to include every country in the world. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my concern is uh, the issue of uh, breaking the political firewall of getting the policy of universal coverage accepted by the highest level of office in the country. I recall that recently the Kenyan parliament passed the bill for universal coverage but Mr. President refused to give assent. In Nigeria in 2011, the parliament passed the health care bill. The president refused to give assent. And in each of those two occasions, the reason was because the financial implications of implementing those documents was too high for the government to bear. So may you let us know, please, what happened in the case of Mexico. How were the policy drafters able to convince Mr. President that this is something worth doing and something that they can do? Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I would say even that before Mr. President, Mr. Minister of Finance was the first target because those are usually the, um, the first hurdle uh, because they, they have this short-term view of the budgetary implications. Now Mexico, in that period of time I served as minister, had a very orthodox minister of finance. And everyone says, how on earth did you pass a law that created entitlements for which, you know, good ministers of finance will almost have an anaphylactic reaction when they hear the word entitlement. Two, created a budgetary obligation over uh, a seven year period with, with increases that actually added to one additional percentage point of GDP. Uh, how did that happen? It happened with good evidence and because we showed I think convincingly that the status quo was more, more uh, expensive than this, that this was going to cost one point, but that the status quo was more expensive. I think the best decision I ever made was to create an economic analysis unit in the ministry and hire a card carrying PhD in economics from Chicago, same place that the Minister of Finance had gotten his PhD, um, <laughs> to actually come to the meetings with very, very, very solid evidence. And what we showed was a graph where, like in Kenya, the parliament had passed, a, uh, had passed an, a, a law that required to get to 5% of GDP over a four-year period. Okay, it was two and a half, so it was doubling the GDP for public expenditures. That was a doubling and two and a half per, per percentage points in a four-year period, and it was the kind of approach that's the blank check approach, you know, 5%, why 5%, and what are you gonna do with that money? That was not stipulated. Then we also showed the inertial growth of public expenditures in health, driven by aging, by the changing in, in, in the epidemiologic picture, by the rise in education, and by the rise in political mobilization of people which were demanding health services. And we showed that even without a reform, just with a simpler projection, that was gonna get the country beyond the additional one percentage point. And then we showed our proposal, which was lower and over a longer period, and we said, you either have the choice of accepting you know, this larger increase that's already been passed by one of the two houses, and if it's voted by the second house, you're gonna to have to do something about it, like veto it, like you did, which is politically very expensive, or you have the choice of following the inertia with the current set of great inefficiencies we have, which we had documented. So you know, there's a notion also here developed in a recent book published by, um, by the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights called the cost of inaction. It's the error of thinking that not acting is costless. And the opportunity cost of failing to act is very often more, uh, larger than the, uh, than the cost of acting. And it was actually making those arguments with very s strong set of numbers. And it shows, again, the interplay of the technical and the political pillars in a, in a very clear way. But that, that was the, the way we, we faced exactly the same resistance, but showing that this was actually less expensive than not implementing it was the key uh, to be persuasive.